Dear Rail Lovers, welcome to Railways Explained. In this video, we decided to take you on a journey into the railway past, as we will discuss the construction of one of the most famous railway lines in the whole world, the Trans-Siberian Railway. We remind you that in one of the previous videos, we already covered the topic of the world's first transcontinental railway in the United States. As you all know, over the years, the Trans-Siberian Railway has played a significant role and has been of great importance not only for the Russian and world history of transport, but it also had a unique place in the national, economic and military history of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. In that sense, as always, we will try to cover all important aspects, including the circumstances that led to the decision to construct this railway, how the process of its construction went, what are the impacts and effects it had, what was its role in terms of national defense, and finally, where is the Trans-Siberian Railway in the 21st century. But, before we start, if you consider yourself a rail lover and like our content, subscribe to our channel in order to become part of our rail community. In case you want to receive notifications every time we publish a video, hit the bell button. Now, let's begin. In the late 19th century, the development of Siberia, a strategically important Russian region, was hampered by almost non-existent transport links within the region, as well as with the rest of the country. Aside from the Great Siberian Route, good roads suitable for wheeled transport were rare. For about five months a year, when rivers were navigable, they were the main means of transport. During the rest of the year, cargo and passengers had to travel by horse-drawn sledges over the winter roads, many of which were the ice-covered rivers. The initial proposal to solve this problem by constructing a railway line and to open up Siberia for the development was set out by the general governor of eastern Siberia, Nikolai Muraviova Mursky, in 1857. In the following years, the idea was seriously considered, but the financing of its construction remained an issue, as it did not find support from the Russian government. The main reason was of course the lack of funds, but also different priorities reflected in the fact that it was first important to ensure connection of central Russia with strategically important iron and coal mines. It was not until 1873 that the Ural Railway Company was founded with the aim of helping Russia achieve these goals and when the Russian government began to put serious efforts in preparation for the construction of Trans-Siberian Railway. Also, there were many proposals from foreign entrepreneurs who were interested in financing the construction, but the Russian government decided to use its own funds, as this was considered as threatening the foreign influence over the resource-rich areas. However, the first major step, which would lead to the start of the construction, was finally made on March 9, 1891, when the Russian government issued an imperial decree announcing that there was an intention to construct a railway across Siberia. Few months later, Tsarevich Nicholas, later Tsar Nicholas II, inaugurated the construction in Vladivostok on May 19. The difficulties faced by the workers of the Trans-Siberian Railway can hardly be exaggerated. To give you a sense of the scale, with 9,289 kilometers, it was longer by 3,218 kilometers than the Canadian Transcontinental Railway between St. Jones on the Atlantic coast and Vancouver on the Pacific coast. The Transcontinental Railroad in the United States, completed in 1869, was much shorter and required not more than 2,826 kilometers of new railway tracks, as the section in the east had already been built. For comparison, if you don't count the already existing section on the Trans-Siberian Line, from Moscow to Chelyabinsk, the Trans-Siberian Railway still required more than 7,242 kilometers of new railway tracks. If it's still hard to imagine how long this line is, we will only say that it accounts for the one-fifth of the circumference of the whole planet. However, in order to optimize the construction, the railway was divided into three major sections, the Western, Mid-Siberian and Far Eastern lines. Each of them was further subdivided into several sections, and works on the most of them proceeded simultaneously, using a large number of workers. Let us bring in some figures. 
In the first steps of construction, about 9.6 thousand people were employed, while in the middle the number of workers grew up to 84 to 89 thousand. By the way, most of these workers worked for free, given the fact they were the prisoners. It is really not necessary to emphasize how bad the weather conditions were and how technically challenging it was to build a railway in the areas of long-lasting ice and extremely harsh winters. Anyway, the construction work started at both ends, from Vladivostok in the east and Chelyabinsk in the west, and progressed towards the center. The treaty between Russia and China, signed in 1896, in history noted as Lee Lobanov Treaty or the Sino-Russian Secret Treaty, allowed the Russians to construct a 1,287 km of railway through the northern Chinese region of Manchuria, as this was the shortest and most favorable route to Vladivostok. Therefore, between 1897 and 1903, the Russian government constructed the so-called Chinese Eastern Railway thus connecting Vladivostok with sections in western and central Siberia. The Transmanchurian line later came under full Chinese control after the World War II. By 1904, the Trans-Siberian Railway was a connection from Vladivostok through China and Siberia to the Ural Mountains. However, one of the main obstacles for the completion of this project was the Baikal Lake. Baikal Lake is more than 640 kilometers long and more than 1600 meters deep. The construction project included construction of the Circumbaikal Railway section as a bypass of the Baikal Lake. It is an unique engineering achievement and it represents one of the most picturesque signs of the whole area. The construction of this section was completed in 1905, but even before, the connection was possible given the fact that the line ended on the two sides of the lake. The ice-breaking train ferry SS Baikal, built in 1897, and the smaller ferry SS Angara, built about a decade later, made the crossing possible by four hours of navigation. After the Russo-Japanese War from 1904 to 1905, Russia feared Japan's possible takeover of Manchuria region and made decision to build a longer and more difficult alternative route, the so-called Amur Railway in order to enable connection to Vladivostok through exclusively Russian territory. So, by 1916, the section north of Amur River was completed, and in that way, the continuous railway line within Russian territory from Moscow across Siberia to Vladivostok, in the length of 9,289 kilometers, has finally been completed. The European part of Trans-Siberian Railway covers about 19% of the total length, while the Asian part accounts for about 81%. What is also interesting, it was decided not to use the standard 1,435mm railway gauge, but the unconventional one of 1,524mm. This gauge became known as the Russian gauge, and it was later replaced by the Soviet railways with a gauge of 1,520 mm. The decision to avoid standard gauge was most likely aimed at isolating conservative Russia from progressive Europe, and definitely because of strategic defense reasons which were preventing and hindering possible invasion by foreign powers. Estimated costs of the construction in 1916 ranged from 770 million to 1 billion dollars, which was one fifth of the Russia's national debt at the time. At today's values, this is 24 billion dollars and possibly even more. In any case, the construction of Trans Siberian Railway was an enormous drain on the Russian economy, especially between 1914 and 1916, which greatly influenced the war efforts and later outcome of the Bolshevik Revolution. Despite the criticism, this railway line has more than paid off. Although the area which today constitutes the districts of Ural, Siberia and Far East came under the Russian control as early as the 17th century, the population remained below 300,000 until the early 20th century. The construction of the Trans-Siberian Railway set in motion a large-scale migration process that eventually led to an increase in population to about 36 million, as it is today. Additionally, the Siberian economy, which had been almost non-existent, started rapid expansion. New settlers rapidly cultivated West Siberia's fertile soil, doubling the arable area and making the region one of the main Russia's bread baskets. Floor mills sprang up like mushrooms. 
West Siberia's butter industry has become the second largest in the world after Denmark. Many railway stations had sawmills, stockyards and slaughterhouses, which significantly stimulated the development of the whole region. In general, the Trans-Siberian Railway not only enabled Siberia's industrial revolution, but more importantly, it enabled the integration of vast Russian areas into one unique country. In addition to the contribution to the economy, the construction of this railway line had one negative and immediate consequence. It provoked a war with Japan. Yes, the construction of this railway line across Manchuria immediately provoked the Russo-Japanese War. Although the Russians did not believe that the Japanese would attack, it took place in February 1904. The Japanese wanted to take advantage of the inability of the recently completed railway line to carry out the burden of the war as well as the fact that the Circumbica line has not yet been completed. These two factors were crucial for the decision and the timing of the attack. Also, the supply train between Moscow and Manchuria took 5 or 6 weeks, instead of about 10 days, which was supposed to be the case. Because of that, Russia was unable to quickly deliver troops and supplies to the battlefield, which finally led to the loss of the war. Although the Japanese had a railway connection all the way to the heart of Russia, it is believed that the track gauge prevented Japanese from carrying out a further invasion. The Trans-Siberian Railway has proved to be ineffective for one more time, during the First World War. The main reason was considered to be the inability of the Tsarist regime to efficiently manage the railway and organize the traffic, which resulted in inability to timely and adequately deliver supplies and the troops where necessary. Unlike the First World War, the Trans-Siberian Railway had a good performance under the command of the Communist Party and Stalin. Following the German attack in 1941, there was an immediate evacuation of industry in the threatened areas to the east on a series of hundreds of special trains. In a quite remarkable maneuver, whole factories were packed up into wagons and transported to pre-planned locations. Most of the industry was simply transferred to Western Siberia, and in that way, for example, Chelyabinsk became a center for tank production. Some factories have been relocated even further east. According to one historian, it was the most important feat the Soviets achieved in the Second World War, in the sense that it facilitated their eventual victory over Germany. Nowadays, the Trans-Siberian Railway is a modern, double-track electrified line, the backbone of the Russian economy and the line that provides access to the railway networks of China and Mongolia. It is interesting that electrification of this line lasted over 70 years, from 1929 to 2002. Trans-Siberian Railway is also of great importance as part of the economic corridor that connects East and the West of Eurasia and plays an important role within the Belt and Road Initiative which we also dealt with in one of the previous videos. Beside that, taking a journey as a passenger on the Trans-Siberian Railway is a real adventure and a great opportunity to see literally all sides of diverse and immense Russia. If you would like to take a 7-day ride from Moscow to, for example, Vladivostok, as we do, try to check out this amazing website. It's not as good as the actual travel, but at least we can all see what we are missing. Trans-Siberian Railway usually starts in beautiful Moscow, passes through the most interesting cities of the European part of Russia, including Kazan and Ekaterinsburg, followed by the stunning landscapes of Ural Mountains and Georgia's panoramas of Siberia and the Lake Baikal. It also crosses the mighty 2 km long Amur Bridge and the 7 km long tunnel under the Amur River, proceeding with the untouched Russian steppes and the final stop in eastern capital of Russia, Vladivostok. For the end, we would like to announce that in the following period, we will continue the series dedicated to transcontinental railways, so the next one will be Canadian Transcontinental Railway. This was Railways Explained, we hope you enjoyed and learned something new about the railways of the world. Until the next video, goodbye.